would just be like, can I get this? Can I get this? Can I get it depends. This? It depends. You see, every guy wasn't a credit card scammer. Some was dope boys. Some was um, businessmen. So you got to hire guys where you can be like, hi, can I see your credit card? Um, can you buy me this? And they pull out their credit cards. So I can whoop, take a picture of it, or I knew which one to take. If I was to go through their um, pockets or something, they got the dope boys where, okay, um, he get messed up here. He drink a little bit too much or he smoking too much weed. And he goes to his drawer, hey, can we go to the mall? He's putting in the safe conversation. Now, whoop, I done seen you put in your safe conversation. Now, I got it. People just doing too much, moving too fast, man. Just not knowing who you're around. It wasn't even that serious. They just didn't know who they was wrong. It's all street stuff. Nobody's wrong. No rules in the streets at all. Nobody's wrong. It was cool. Hello, my name is Ryan Gibbons, creator and host of That Look docuseries. Thank you for joining us. In 2003, in New York City, I was introduced to a man that everyone called The Baker. I came to learn that he was once convicted on some of the biggest financial crimes in the history of New York. Of course, I want to interview him, but due to him being in New York and me in Atlanta, we haven't quite found the time to get it done. But back in the day, when the baker was doing his one-two, he would always travel to Atlanta. And where he would really attend was the Atlanta strip clubs. And this is where he would befriend one of ATL's best kept secrets, a stripper by the name of Georgia Jill. To many, Georgia Jill was just a stripper, but to those that knew her and or felt her hustle in a negative way, she was one of the biggest con artists to ever hit the A. After being put in contact with her, she agreed to do an interview. So here it is, my exclusive sit down with Georgia Jill. What's up, this your girl, Jilly Jill, for real. I'm from Decatur, Georgia, and this is my story. My childhood was amazing, honestly. Um, if sport was a person, it was definitely me. Um, I didn't want for anything growing up, anything I ever wanted to do. My parents were supportive of me, um, from being a cheerleader to playing in the band to trying to run track. I did any and everything I ever wanted to do as a child. Um, my neighborhood was amazing growing up. I grew up in the suburbs, um, starting from the hood. When I first moved down here, we came from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, coming from the hood, coming from um, a little bit more Tetris area than down here. Um, it was like a breath of fresh air, quote unquote, but um, I grew up in a very, very nice suburban neighborhood. And what did your mother do for a living? Um, my mother passed away, rest in peace, but she was a nurse and she did real estate as well. My mother owned two homes, a duplex in the house to be exact. A father, an entrepreneur slash paralegal, um, life wasn't bad at all. Great family, great life. But as the old saying goes, all good things must come to an end. How long were your mother and father married? Um, my mother and father were married for about 23 years before I came along. Um, my parents are older. My mother was 65 when she passed away. Um, my father is now 70 years old. I'm an old, so my parents are old. <laughs> what was the uh, reason uh, your father left? Did you ever find out the reason your father left? Yes, sir. Um, my father got on drugs really bad. My father went from a paralegal to a um, heroin addict. My father got on heroin extremely bad. Lost, lost everything. When my father started to do heroin, I noticed changes in our lives. Um, downgrading of apartments, homes, cars. Um, my mother went from picking me up 
from school every day to walking to come get me. Um, then one day I never see my father again. Um, what kind of effect did that have on your mother? Did you see a change in her? I definitely saw a change in my mother. Um, knowing what I know now, she became more distant as far as friends. Um, her social life, she became more focused on me and my brother. Um, from what I've seen, it made her more stronger. It made her more willing to want more. In school, I was amazing. Um, up until about ninth, tenth grade, I was a cheerleader. Why uh, did you drop out of school in tenth grade? Um, just getting caught up in life, um, having ADHD. School had got boring. I was no longer interested in cheerleading. My boyfriend was a dope dealer. Like I was smoking weed. There was no point of going to school. Like I didn't. I didn't feel like there was no point, rather, anymore, you know? So I just stopped. Also, believe it or not, I was kind of bullied out of school by my teacher, believe it or not. I believe my teacher knew I was from the hood. Like I said, I was the only one in the hood going to a Christian school and the only one at the Christian school riding the bus. If you rode the bus, that meant your parents couldn't come pick you up or whatever the case may have been. And I just feel like my fourth grade teacher took advantage of that. Um, it made me feel less of um, less than, rather. I automatically felt like I was an outcast. I even remember her saying, if you ride the bus, stand up. And I was the only person in the classroom standing up. It made me not ever want to go to school again. And I'm guessing that was a white teacher, too. Um, believe it or not, it wasn't. She wow. was actually black. Believe it or not, it was only, um, growing up, I only had two black teachers, and she was the only one who, yeah. Yeah, no, she was not white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was the only teacher that um, belittled me, believe it or not. Um, I experienced, personally, more racism in my own culture, Viva, you know, versus not, you know. And at this time, um, do you know where your father was? And how did that make you feel with him not being around? Um, at this point, I had no idea where my father was. Um, I didn't, I never thought of it. I never thought of him in a, in a negative way, let me say that. I thought of him, but I never, I never thought negative. I even remember my mother telling me one day, like, you never asked about your father. Like, I never worried, quote unquote. I knew he was okay. I knew he wasn't okay, but I knew he was okay though, you know? Did you ever wish he was in your life? Of course, I wish he was back with me. Um, I wonder what he was doing rather than was he okay. I knew my, my father was okay. My father's a, a survivor. You know, I was raised by survivors, both strong and, black people. And while you was in the street, um, like just getting into things kids do, what was your mom doing at this time? Like what was your relationship like? Was she working a lot? Was she was y'all going back and forth? Definitely working a lot. Um, my mother was a workaholic. My mother was a workaholic. I do it for the ones that are not for the hood. Um, you know, uh, TMI, I do it for the ones that are just from homes, broken homes like the one I come from, whose parents just know money over everything. It's okay to not put work for your children, you know? Do you think you would have gotten into less trouble if your mother wasn't working so much? I do. There would have been um, the physical protection, the physical watching, not just the knowledge given. It would have been a little bit of all three, you know? With a father addicted to heroin and a mother always working, Jill would inevitably find the love and attention that's needed for any youth growing up in another male team. And once again, the pattern from good to bad, we'll repeat for Jill. I met my first boyfriend 
through this girl, it was it was love at first sight. <laughs> How did you find out uh, he was selling drugs, and it, was that the in, your introduction to street life by dating him? Um, that definitely wasn't my introduction to street life. Well, it was and it wasn't because my father was from the streets, my parents was from the streets, but um, as far as me seeing and physically being a part of, I guess it was. So, um, yeah, you can say it was my introduction. Um, no, he didn't shower me with drugs or show me anything. He was really sweet. Um, I went off what I heard, not what he told me. He didn't tell me too much of anything. What eventually um, happened to that situation? Um, he ended up getting killed. Uh, rest in peace, mine. Um, watched the company he. Um, what did you hear happen to him? Um, I heard um, various different stories, but what I can say and what I honestly know for sure is that everything is already written. And um, he did too much and had too many of the wrong type of people around him. Free game, it's never your enemy. Keep an eye on your close friends. Rest in peace, Armand. Mon Flemister, gone for not, but not forgotten. How was he killed? Um, he was shot in the back of the head and in the back. He was. was shot where, where where was he killed at um he was killed outside of his house so it was definitely probably somebody that he knew exactly yes how did that was that your first major loss after your father not been in your life yes and how did you handle that um horrible my heart closed up i was now numb i didn't love after that didn't want to, didn't feel the need to, didn't pursue anything after that. Um, did you have any idea or did the streets have any idea who actually committed the murder? Yes, sir. Um, the guy who they claimed killed him um, ended up getting killed as well. Now, I, I did an interview earlier today and it was a similar situation um once you found out um that he had been murdered how did that did that bring you some kind of relief um the guy who killed him yeah yeah i was happy <laughs> i was ecstatic suffering another big loss would only push jill deeper into the street life I became a hustler um, due to, I can honestly say, just reminiscing the lack of um, attention. Um, most people I was around yearned for the lack, for yearned for love. Most people I was around yearned for love where I yearned for the attention of the motherly love that I knew I had the fatherly love that I knew I have that, that I didn't receive. Um, wanting more for myself, but not knowing how to go about it. Um, it made me, made me mischievous to run the streets. It made me mischievous and um, I kind of just did what I wanted to out of frustration of attention, lack of attention. Jill will find the attention she was seeking in the wrong place. She will hook up with criminal elements of her neighborhood. This is when she began scamming. The first thing I got into was swindling. Um, I never was as bold as some may have thought, as one may have heard of me. Um, my mouth was my gift. Um, people saw that, I say people, the, the people I was around. Um, AKA guys saw that I was a talker and kind of used me to manipulate their plays, if that makes sense. Um, I dealt with a lot of scammers. 
con artist rather at a young age. Um, what are some of the type of scams y'all would do? Um, like I said, just I'm manipulating people, I'm manipulating them to send their information, um, debit card information, socials. They will do whatever with them. At the time, I I was unaware. I knew what I was doing, but I was unaware of what they were doing. So you hooked up with a, a, a group of guys. They would start the process. They would tell you what was going on, and then you they would bring you in as the person to make it official with the professional voice or whatever. Right. Um, not even necessarily tell me what was going on. They would just um, bribe. Hey, Jill, I give you three hundred. I give you four hundred. Did My, you say this or say that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, um, mind you, I'm young. I'm working. Mind you, my parents are from the streets, but I'm just as innocent as possible. Like, it just, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't know. When this is going on, what age are you? Oh, at this time, I'm about 13, 14 years old. So you 13 to 14, you're running scams and getting money. Now, were these dudes, did, was they getting big money at this time, or was it just they still, like, kind of low level? Um, we were all around the same age. Um, we are seeing about 1,000 to 2,000. At the time, there was something called the dollar trick, where they went to the ATM, did put a little code in, um, literally put in a dollar, and then a thousand will come out. So we're like 13, <laughs> 14 years old, getting thousands of dollars. Like three plays, that's $3,000. Back in the days where Air Force Ones and the LRG outfit was the thing. So even just spending $300, you still had five and six in your pocket. We was living in Villa Loca. I personally got deep into it when I was about 17. Just growing up in a city like Atlanta, it just seemed like the thing to do. Personally, honestly, I was enticed by the life. After being placed on probation, Jill decided to play it safe and get a legal job. But it wouldn't be long so she was being pulled in to another life. So um, this guy I knew and this guy I was introduced to um, basically saw I was more than what I was, um, more than the environment of Smoothie King. It was like, you need to be a stripper. And I'm like, what? Like, stripper? Like me? No way. I, um, I remember him taking me to the club. Um, just as a friend, just as a customer, you know, just going in there and um, just um, introducing me to the life. Um, he knew what he was doing. He enticed me. I felt like I needed to become a dancer at one point. I literally felt like I belonged the first day I walked in there as a customer. So you weren't you weren't scared at all to get naked or nothing. You just you just it just felt like that's where you were supposed to be from the gate. Oh yeah, and it's crazy how you said that. I was horrified. I was scared. I was nervous. I never. I remember walking in there and seeing one girl, and she was butt ass naked. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I wasn't scared, I was just more shocked, like, wow, like, whoa, like, she's naked. Like, she's butt ass, like in Atlanta, there's strip clubs all over the world, but Atlanta, Georgia, they get butt ass naked, like, nah. I'm like, wow, she's butt naked, at, like, with nothing going, and she's okay with it. I was like, whoa, you know, yeah. So I started at Kamal's 21, which is now called Platinum. I had Google which clubs was the hottest clubs in Atlanta. So everybody hears about the world famous Magic City, but Magic City didn't hire me. 
but they was like I was too thick. Like I heard they liked it skinny girls or whatever. I'm like, huh? But whatever. So I just went to another club. I went to platinum. Um, platinum was excuse me. I went to platinum. Platinum was more laid back, more um, more money oriented. If that makes sense, Magic City was more business. They call each other a family, whatever that's supposed to mean. Nah, Platinum was it. <laughs> so you got Platinum hired. was dope. I got hired, um, just started working from then on there. Did you have to dance? Did you audition? Okay, no, so I didn't have to audition. So auditioning at Platinum was just get naked, let them see your body, then they hire you or not. So you literally just got naked in front of the manager. I guess. After seeing the strip club for the first time, Jill was primed and ready for the life or at least she thought she was. It's crazy, like, my first night it was like, okay, so you put on your outfit and then you like get dressed. Okay, so you go down there, you, you get naked, you put on a costume, an outfit, like a bikini like outfit, and it's like, what's next? That's exactly how I feel. Mind you, most of these girls adapted to that environment. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> okay. I didn't know what to do at all. I didn't get on stage to about four months of me dancing, yes. So despite the tattoos and stuff, the, the outgoing personality, I always was outgoing. I always was a natural born leader, a daredevil, but I never been daring enough to do something of that nature, if that makes sense. I, I was scared as hell. I was scared as hell. Um, it was nothing how it looked. Um, It was nothing how it looked. I literally had to get drunk to do it. Um, at, at this time, I, I'm 19. I started dancing when I was 19. I'm 29. Um, I was 19. I was scared. I was... I appeared... I was more afraid than I appeared. I wasn't built for it. I wasn't built for nothing I, I had signed up for. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. six, seven months to get the swing of things to, okay, getting on stage equals more money, um, being a little bit comfortable, aka drinking a little bit more. That's what I had to do personally. Make me more comfortable. It makes you more um, willing to talk to more people, more customers equals more money, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, at what point did you find out everything was what it seems? When did you find out like it was deeper? And what was the situation that made you feel that way? Everything wasn't what it seemed. Um, prostitution. How much prostitution do you think goes on in Atlanta strip clubs? I think a lot of it, at least um, 80% more than what you would think. Yeah. The first time you seen prostitution going on in a strip club, how did that make you feel? Um, the first time I saw prostitution in the strip club, um, I was appalled. 
I was shocked. Um, um, I think I was more shocked out of their reaction. It was more normal, if that makes sense. Um, they wasn't as surprised as getting caught. <laughs> so you've actually seen a girl have sex in the Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you, yeah. Make, did you make eye contact with the girl? Like, was it a situation to where, like, she's like, oh, damn, she seen me having sex? Yeah. And it was as if nothing happened. As if it was like a kid getting ready to go home from school. Hey, here's your book back. Hey, come on, time to go. Yeah, nah. Um, so how did you react the first time somebody uh, tried to pay you for sex? When men tried to pay me to have sex with them, I cussed them out, I ignored them, or I swindled them. It was more of swindling than anything. Um, but in the beginning, I was like, what? Um, it was so belittling. It was so, it was so belittling of them. It was so, um, comfortable, um, knowing what I know now. I ran into a lot of, um, immature, ignorant men who really just didn't respect women. I made it real clear that you were going to respect me, period. Jill wasn't a fan of prostitution but the fact that men wanted to have sex with her would create an opportunity for her to make money in a different way and what many label as finessing. Okay, so what I would do if a guy tried to pay me for sex and I wasn't with it at all, um, it's what one would call, here in Atlanta we use a heavy finesse. So basically I would tell them, yeah, lead them on. Um, I will always get money up front. Okay, let me see, give it to me up front and just never come back. My strategy personally, ooh, excuse me, personally, a lot of those women are, um, they have men and pimps. That's a real pimp whole game. So me being a single independent woman by myself, I would just lead them on and lie. I would pay the security guard, hey, yo, let me give you $30, let me give you $20. I just pay him, like, you know, kick him out or something. Like, go on VIP. Men think, oh, you're in VIP. You're going to have sex with them. And most women do. Some women do. I'm not going to even say most. Some women do. Some women don't. I know a lot of the women that I met was personally like me. They didn't do anything of that nature. Um, shout out to, you know, some of the older women I met who taught me and showed me, hey, that ain't it. But because it's that world, you're going to get tried anyway. So when they tried me, they got finessed. Did you ever, at any point, decide to have sex for money? Saw so I didn't conquer. It wasn't something I could do. It wasn't something I was raised off doing. I would never call myself a prostitute, but it's something that I definitely um, was enticed into doing. It's something that I was very, um, I was very, what's the word? I was very curious, despite how crazy it sounds. Men, especially black men, from what I saw at that time, Black men really love promiscuous women. It was something I was honestly very, very curious about. I was curious as to why men liked it, hoes. Now, when you was um, making money, having sex, um, what's the most you made at a time or what's the most you ever made like or accumulate how much money do you think you made over time um i never made money having sex i made money swindling lying about having sex going to rather so i was a con artist i made thousands and thousands of dollars being a con artist hate got me in the door people love what they heard about men love what they can't have. So believe it or not, I was so like talked about 
and hated on when they met me. They would just love me. And then they would expect the worst because of what somebody done told them and stuff. And then they met me and I was just the sweetest, purest, just coolest thing ever. And they were never suspected. And then it was like, okay, they see me, I'm, I'm on my shit, I got stuff going on, AKA I got um, things by myself. I'm nothing like what they heard. And then I guess that's what made them bring their guard down. So um, it was more like, gotcha, you know? <laughs> it was more like that, but it was like, you didn't know me anyway, if that makes sense. It, it, it was all he said, she said, um, free game. God gave everybody a mind of their own, but not everybody has a mind of their own. It was like, he said, she said, and Okay, so you know what was one of the main things you would do once they let their guards down? Would you ask them for a credit card? Would you get credit cards? Would you would you have them just buy you stuff? It was just basically whatever you wanted. You would just be like, "Can I get this? Can I get this?" Can I it depends. This? It depends. You see, every guy wasn't a credit card scammer. Some was dope boys. Some was um, businessmen. So you got to hot guys where you can be like, "Hi, can I see your credit card? Um, can you buy me this?" And they pull out their credit cards like a whoop. Take a picture of it or I knew which one to take. If I was to go through their um, pockets or something, they got the dope boys where, okay, um, he get messed up here. He drink a little bit too much or he smoking too much weed. And he goes to his drawer, hey, can we go to the mall? He's putting in the safe conversation. Now, whoop, I done seen you put in your safe conversation. Now, I got it. You know, now I know your safe code. You know, so it's, it's, it's just... It was just a mixture of um, people just doing too much, moving too fast, man. Just not knowing who you're around. It wasn't even that serious. They just didn't know who they was around. It's all street stuff. Nobody's wrong. No rules in the streets at all. Nobody's wrong. It was cool. Be careful doing that. In the words of my mother, watch hustling men. They might find out you're doing it and kill you. Everybody has emotions. But yeah, I was really just playing with their emotions. I've been in actually about two, three um, situations where uh, something really, really bad could have happened to me, but it didn't, thank God. But yeah. At the top of her game, with no worries at all, Jill would experience what a surprisingly high number of women experienced in their lifetime, the act of being raped. When I first saw and met the guy that raped me, my goal was to get the money that I saw him throw. Um, I had seen him throw, I had seen him twice in the club. I had seen him throw an abundance of money on um, uh, this girl twice. So my goal was to just, oh, get some bread, quote unquote, yes sir. I studied him for about like a week, you know, a week, and, a week or two, you know. And then you had you seen your opportunity to approach him and then what was that conversation like? Um. There really wasn't a conversation. I asked him for a dance. He danced me, quote unquote, allowed me to dance for him in the strip club. And um, it went from there. You know, we had went out. I didn't go straight home with him. It was no prostitution type um, entanglement at first. It was just me being too trustworthy, thinking I knew him because he threw all this money on his girl going out and then that led from one thing to another. Long story short, went back to my house, engaged in a conversation and I passed out, pers um, I passed out. Um, personally, I believe he put something in my drink. I was an alcoholic at the time, I was drinking, but I don't remember myself being that belligerent to have passed out. Um, anywho, I woke up to him having unprotected sex with me, and after that, I um, looked at him and was like, yo, what's going on? Um, he literally asked me, did I want him to leave? I remember saying yes, and I passed back out. Um, that's how dark that world is. I don't know if I was just drunk or did he personally put something in my drink, but I just know sex, drugs, greed, overrules in that type of environment. Very dark, 
place. Um, do you feel like he raped you? Oh yeah, most definitely. Yes, sir. Without a doubt. I know for a fact he did rape me. I don't know if he put something in my drink and drugged me. I know for a fact I was raped. I don't know if I was drugged. Yeah. And so when you accused him of rape, what did he say to you? Um, I was embarrassed. So I didn't say anything until about four months later. Um, he replied, oh, broke people say anything. I had blasted him over the internet to be exact. Oh, blah, 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 rape me, to be exact. So this is a known guy around Atlanta? Oh, no, he, he's, no. Nah. That's what I'm saying. He wasn't even nobody I would honestly talk to, no. Okay. Looked like a creep, Look as lame as he is, I guess. You know, no. Nah. So did you report him or you just decided just to let it go? I did not, um, believe it or not. Um, it wouldn't have stuck in the courtroom, believe it or not. Knowing what I know now, Georgia's a Republican state. There wouldn't have been enough evidence, believe it or not. Yeah. So after you was raped, um, how did that change you as a person? Did you go back to stripping? Did you... Did you get it heavy into drugs? Like, what was the aftermath of you being raped? Um, the aftermath of me being raped, I felt bad. I felt belittled. I felt um, disgusting. I felt like it was my fault. I felt like it was time for change. I felt that I would never let my guard down again. No one would ever get that close to me again. No man could randomly come to my house after that. It grew. It, it grew. I grew from it. Everything was a learning process. I grew from it. So um, did you continue to dance after that? Um, did you continue to um, uh, scam and all that? No, sir. It made me a little bit weary. It made me more cautious. It made me, um, I had a wanting to spirit, a continuance spirit, a continuance in the body, if that makes sense. It's mind, body, and soul, but my mind was dull. My mind no longer wanted to continue in that world I was in, but my body kept going, if that makes sense. After being raped, slowly but surely, Jill was ready to give up the game for something more positive. My turning point was me realizing my worth, um, realizing what that world held and what it was. That's a very dark world, very dark place. I no longer want to be a part of that life. So what was the process of you getting out of that life? Um, did you wake up, did you say, what did you do? You woke up, went back to school, did you, what was the point the process of you leaving the strip club and get, becoming legit? Um, the process of me leaving was me just completely stopping. I never was from that world. I didn't come from that world. It was more of a reprogram. Um, just knowing my worth and um, knowing I was better than that. Today, Jill is a successful businesswoman and mentor for several youth, and is now reaching positive heights that sometimes still even leaves her in disbelief. You know, that's my past, and I am so blessed to have overcame it and to be um, a spokeswoman. I call myself now a spokeswoman for young ladies and gentlemen to stay out the streets. I am author, author of Dolce After Dark, part one. Part two, soon come. Um, I am a youth motivational speaker, and I own a group home. Um, God is amazing. I gave my life to Christ. And it is what it is. That's what it is. He's comes before any and everything in my life. He guides my life. And um, also, I do credit repair. As you can see here with my office. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. And on that note, I'm going to leave you with some words of wisdom from Georgia Jill. 
no, seriously, like all you young ladies who think it's dope to be dancers, strippers, con women, whatever, in the street chicks, it is so such a waste of time. You are a woman, stay a woman first. Um, I don't care how much money you accumulate, what you decide to do in this world, stay a lady. Ladies of everything who run the world, Beyonce say the best girls. And it's okay to stay out the streets. Stay out the streets, young ladies and gentlemen. The world is yours.